Hello and welcome to another marathon presented by the True Crime Man's Dark Imagination YouTube channel. I am Alan Gotro, your host. Again, we relied on the polls that were posted under the community tab, and this is how our subscribers responded. As in the last marathon, we will thank some subscribers and then present the video. Here are some of the other supporters of our channel. KG, Henry Moritz, Julie Anderson, Sabrina Carter, John Edward, Leon Dark, Luke Cauley, Silver American, Cherry Runner, Mrs. Mercury, Earl Thomas, Pamela Kirk, Julie Mays, Garof Coley, Thomas Duff, Mum Boo Boo World, Bo Walker, Utarsh Anon, Ian Kelly, Junas Turakoski, Mike Shaw, Christine, Janet Laverne, Froldar, Bree Kinghorn, Christy Kohler, Maria Kay, Amanda Hillegeist, Stephen Hill, Nancy Zurovich, and Elaine Tancho. And now, without any further ado, here is our presentation. On January 29, 1829, the condemned man walked up the steps to the scaffold for the executioner to carry out the sentence he received a little over a month before. After his death, the body was cut down and brought to the local medical school where students and experienced doctors alike viewed the autopsy. Later, a death mask was made so that future generations would know about the infamous body snatchers. In fact, the dead murderer garnered so much fascination with the public that a riot broke out when people tried to get in to see the autopsy. The death of this one inmate became a catalyst for a new direction for the treatment of earthly remains. But it is not the changes in society's treatment of dead bodies that generates great interest in those who are aficionados of true crime. It is the case itself that changed the law and the dark personalities that saw profit in death. At the beginning of the 19th century, Edinburgh, Scotland became a center for medical knowledge, including but not limited to surgery and vivisection. A great deal of the knowledge accumulated as a result of this explosion of learning also included many groundbreaking elements in the study of the vascular system of the human body. At that time, in the interests of science, Scottish law dictated that the dissection of bodies must be limited to dead prisoners, victims of suicide, and deceased orphaned children. Because of the knowledge explosion, it appeared that around the beginning era of the 19th century, this area of the world had a shortage of bodies with which to dissect for the advancement of medical science. Most of the corpses dissected had to be recycled and those decomposed very quickly so that the systems being studied within a body broke down and the structures became inaccurate. Soon thereafter, Grave robbing became the way in which the corpses needed would be supplied. Grave robbers, or as some would refer to them, resurrectionists, soon found the families of newly buried loved ones who posted guards over their graves to prevent any thefts. At the time, the irony was that robbing a grave was illegal, but stealing the corpse from that grave was not because, legally, it did not belong to anyone. In some instances, Loved ones would take the corpses of their dearly departed and bring it to the local university to collect the large bounty for a dead body. Many unsavory characters saw the profit in supplying those bodies to the local medical college for their research. For one individual, William Hare, this would be a way to make easy money. William Hare was an Irish immigrant to Scotland who lived in Edinburgh with very few employment opportunities 
and shrinking finances. He met a fellow worker, William Burke, as the two worked on a harvest in Pennycook. The two were also tenants in a lodging house called Tanner's Close. Hare brought with him from the Emerald Isle a reputation as a heavy drinker and rambunctious behavior. Hare had become very good friends with the widowed owner of the lodging house, a woman named Margaret. Pretty soon, Hare and the widow began managing the house as a married couple. Although the two couples were not especially close, together with William Burke and his wife Helen, the four seemed to express a love of alcohol and ways to make easy money. Eventually, the money-making schemes came to fruition when one of the tenants of the lodging house, a man named Donald, one who was advanced in years, passed away while he still owed Hare and Margaret some money for his rent. The two men realized, having been strapped for cash in the past, they could profit from the lodger's demise. Once they decided what course to take, Burke and Hare took Donald's body from the coffin, replaced it with a sack of bark, and then brought the body to Professor Robert Knox at the anatomy offices in Edinburgh University. Professor Knox requested that the two men bring the body to him after nightfall and they would receive their compensation. Dr. Knox paid the men seven pounds, 10 shillings for their delivery. Contrary to historical belief, Burke and Hare were not grave robbers. Grave robbing entailed heavy labor and sometimes the condition of the corpse would not be considered fresh. Therefore, the two men devised a scheme that proved profitable, yet with the increase in their greed, they soon became the most morbid entrepreneurs in Scottish legal history. Seeing the profitability from selling fresh corpses, Burke and Hare actually stumbled across their first victim back at the lodging house. A miller named Joseph, who had fallen desperately ill, Burke and Hare decided to be angels of mercy, so to speak, and end the man's misery. One evening, the two men visited Joseph in his room and plied him with whiskey till he passed out. Burke and Hare then held the man's mouth and nose closed so that he could not breathe, eventually expiring from the chosen method. In February 1828, having no more terminal victims to choose from at the lodging house, Burke and Hare tempted a pensioner, Abigail Simpson, into accompanying them back to the lodging house for some alcohol. Simpson had a long journey ahead of her the following day on her return home, so she willingly went with them. Margaret, William Hare's wife, put the older woman at ease and then served her some drinks. Again, they smothered the victim with Dr. Knox none the wiser as to how the two men acquired the corpse. Margaret Hare even got into the act when she invited a woman to the lodging house and then got her drunk. Once the woman reached a state of absolute inebriation, Margaret sent for her husband as to what to do next. Hare arrived and then the body was sold to Dr. Knox. In April 1828, Burke encountered two women, by all accounts prostitutes, named Mary Patterson and Janet Brown, who happened to be out drinking in a section of Edinburgh known as Canongate. Burke then invited the two women back to his house where they continued their day of drink. Mary Patterson eventually fell asleep from the alcohol and an argument ensued between Burke and Brown. Brown stated that she was leaving and would be back to collect Patterson. Brown then left and went to visit an old landlady of hers, a Mrs. Lawry. After staying with the older lady for a short time, Mrs. Lawry, having been informed of the morning's previous events, urged Brown to go back and get her friend because she may have been in danger. With one of Mrs. Lawry's servants in tow, Brown went back to the Burke residence but was told that Burke and Patterson already left for the evening. Brown insisted that she stay at the house until the two returned and sent the servant back to Mrs. Lowry to report what happened. The landlady sent her servant back to the Burke residence and convinced Brown to leave as Miss Lowry felt that Brown also would not be safe. By this time, Burke had already murdered Patterson and sold her corpse to Dr. Knox. Burke murdered another woman named Effie and received 10 pounds for her corpse. Another woman who Burke encountered had been cornered by the police and was about to be arrested. Burke vouched for the lady, but he murdered her as well, selling her body just a few hours after her demise. It was approximately at this time that Burke and Hare had a falling out, 
Burke accused Hare of selling Dr. Knox corpses behind his back. Burke and his woman, Helen McDougall, agreed to move out of the lodging house as soon as they returned from a visit with relatives. It was easy to see how the two men could have made such a venture profitable, especially when they preyed upon those victims that would not be missed in society, for example, beggars, prostitutes, and generally just poor people trying to survive. It is also easy to see how these people could have become lost in such a sea of humanity. Poverty lingered everywhere, and still does, but with no charitable foundations to assist the downtrodden or government assistance, they had to do whatever they could just to survive. Burke and Hare did not even take into account the age of the victims as long as they would make good cadavers for the dissection table. Their next victim was an elderly grandmother with an affinity for painkillers. When Hare stumbled across the woman's dead body, he noticed her grandson, a young boy of the age of six, crying as he did not know what to do. Hare took the boy in his arms, cradled him, and subsequently broke the child's back. Two more corpses for the anatomy students. Up until this time, the victims that Burke and Hare selected were not members of their immediate community. The two then grew very careless and chose victims that lived either in their own neighborhood or close to it, and whom the students in Dr. Knox's anatomy classes would easily recognize. In choosing their next victim, Burke and Hare set their sights on Mary McDougall, a relative of Burke's common-law wife, Helen. The two men lured the young girl to the house where Hare continued to reside and murdered her outright. Mary Haldane was an aging prostitute who had grown fond of drink and agreed to go with Hare to his lodgings for some alcoholic refreshment. Hare dispatched her very easily, selling her corpse to Dr. Knox. When her daughter, Peggy Haldane, came looking for her, she learned that the last person seen with Mary Haldane was William Hare. Peggy went to the lodging house where Hare and Helen McDougall had been staying and paid Hare a visit. When questioned by Peggy as to where her mother may be, Hare answered that he had not seen her. He spent some time with her, but she left. Peggy then accepted Hare's invitation to have a few drinks. As in typical Burke and Hare fashion, once the victim became quite drunk, Hare murdered her as well. The pair received 10 pounds each for the bodies. Their final victim, James Wilson, better known as Daft Jamie, became a popular barroom entertainer and the residents quickly noticed that he was missing. When the body appeared in one of Dr. Knox's anatomy classes, the students were aghast because they recognized the entertainer. Dr. Knox denied that the corpse was that of Wilson, but the students suspected something afoot at all the fresh corpses they so easily managed to dissect when they knew that such a product was in a rare commodity. Questioned by authorities, Dr. Knox hoped to dispel any involvement of which could have been very scandalous for a professional physician of his stature. The anatomist took it upon himself to decapitate Wilson's head, his deformed foot, and other distinguishing features back then, identifying the corpse as that of James Wilson. On Halloween night, 1828, New lodgers James and Mary Gray volunteered to give up their room for one night when Burke asked a young lady named Mary Doherty to come back to the lodging house. Burke convinced the young woman that he and his mother were related to Doherty and her family. Interested in learning more about the lineage, Doherty accompanied Burke back to the lodging house. Later that night, local neighbors heard loud arguing coming from the lodging house when they heard a woman scream, Murder! After an unsuccessful attempt to locate a policeman, the neighbors returned to their beds after not hearing any further rumblings from the Hare's lodging house. Early the next morning, the Greys returned and learned that Darty was not there. Helen McDougall allegedly got jealous when the young girl became very friendly with Burke and McDougall ordered her to leave. Truthfully, Mary Darty never left the building as McDougall related her story to the Greys. Darty's corpse was under the bed in one of the spare bedrooms covered in hay waiting to be transported to the anatomy offices of Dr. Knox. Later that day, Anne Gray attempted to gain access to the spare bedroom where Darty's body lay. Together with her husband, the two waited until the lodging house was nearly empty and then gained entry into the spare bedroom. 
There, they found Doherty's body. When Helen McDougal returned to the lodging house that afternoon, the Greys confronted her with the truth. She offered them a bribe of 10 pounds a week to keep their silence. The Greys, even though the 10 pounds could have helped their financial situation greatly, decided to go to the police and report what they saw. The police went to the lodging house at the Greys' urging and brought Burke and McDougal in for questioning. When confronted with the accusations, both of them told separate stories that did not seem to substantiate each other's rendition of the events. Later, an anonymous tip led investigators to the business chambers of Dr. Knox, where James Gray identified the remains of Mary Doherty. The police then arrested William Hare and his wife Margaret, hoping to discover the truth. A search of the lodging house yielded the body of Mary Doherty and some blood-stained clothing that belonged to the murderous pair. Of course, each denied knowing of the sinister plot, and Burke decided he wanted to turn on Hare, stating that he knew nothing of where his acquaintance may have procured the corpses. The police cogitated over what to do next. They approached William Hare to turn Crown's evidence against his accomplices so the police could make the case for murder. Hare agreed, with authorities charging Burke and McDougal with the murders of Mary Doherty, James Wilson, and Mary Patterson. Soon after their apprehension, news of this motley group of murderers, Burke, Hare, and their accomplices, reached the public, and soon tales of their misadventures began appearing in newspapers in Scotland, England, and Ireland. Because of the deal that authorities had to make in order to secure the testimony of William Hare, the public clamored as to why there should be such a deal with the devil. As a result of his turncoat behavior, Hare had to wear disguises and be escorted away by policemen from angry mobs who believed his culpability equal to that of Burke in this heinous murder-for-profit scheme. Also during the trial, Margaret Hare and Helen McDougal required police protection as well as the public screamed for them to be lynched along with their paramours. Because of Dr. Knox's involvement, authorities did not charge him as an accessory, but it became very clear that his career as an anatomy professor at Edinburgh University ended with his complicity in receiving the fresh corpses. Dr. Knox eventually left Scotland and lived out the rest of his days in seclusion and quiet, never actually contrite at tacitly persuading two men to kill for money. Altogether, investigators believed that Burke and Hare may have been responsible for the deaths of approximately 16 people who crossed their path. However, when the trial of William Burke began on Christmas Eve, 1828, authorities believed they could only convict him for three of those murders. In a rather short trial, replete with the testimony of accomplices Margaret Hare and William Hare, after 24 hours, a jury found William Burke guilty of the three murders and sentenced him to be hanged by the neck until he was dead. A little over a month later, on January 28, 1829, in front of a crowd of almost 20,000 people, the executioner carried out the sentence of the court and hanged William Burke. On the following day, medical students and instructors dissected his body all in the name of science on the same dissection table as most of his victims had been cut apart. The murder of those for profit and the manner in which the two killers committed their acts also gave a new word to the English language, burking, this term being defined as suffocation with the intent to sell the remains. These two murderers also inspired many copycat killers throughout the United Kingdom under the same circumstances. On March 30, 1892, a new tenant moved into a Windsor suburb house in the city of Melbourne, Australia, and complained of a terrible smell coming from the residence. 
Police arrived at the house and noticed the stench as well. Beneath a hearthstone near the fireplace, authorities located the body of a woman about 30 years old whose throat had been cut, buried, and decomposing for approximately three months. Melbourne police assigned two detectives to the case, Detective Sergeants William Considine and Henry Causey, and they set about investigating into the previous tenant. The leasing agent informed the two police officers that the previous tenant, a man named Druin, ordered that some cement, a broom, a trowel, closet pan, and a spade a few weeks earlier be delivered to the Windsor residence. Druin had been described as in his mid-thirties, fair-haired with reddish tint and red beard, and a large distinctive mustache, and was of medium height in build. Mr. Druin dressed with a lot of flash, with a lot of jewelry, and fine clothes. After an intricate search of the Andrew Street house, Detectives Considine and Causey discovered a worn luggage ticket that stated Druin arrived in Melbourne from England on December 9, 1891, on a passenger vessel named the Kaiser Wilhelm II, accompanied by his wife, Emily. Then Druin traveled under the name of Albert Williams. Detectives Considine and Causey also questioned the other passengers on the ship and had no trouble recollecting the loud, boisting, oafish behavior of Mr. Williams, who brought anyone who could find to listen to his obviously fictitious adventures to every corner of the globe. Williams also accused the passengers and crew of stealing valuables from him during the course of the journey. Detectives Considine and Causey believed that the badly decomposed corpse found at the residence located at 57 Andrew Street could have been no one other than Emily Williams. After their suspicions had been semi-confirmed that the woman buried under the hearthstone fit the general description of Emily Williams, the authorities issued a nationwide alert for Williams and his description appeared in every police station all over Australia. The detectives believed that if Williams stuck to his modus operandi, he would not be that hard to apprehend. With a fugitive on the loose, the story of Emily Williams grabbed the headlines and saw the story travel throughout the world. A few days after the issuing of the description, an employee from a passenger liner stated that he recognized a man matching Williams' description who boarded a vessel on January 23rd from Melbourne to Perth in Western Australia. Detectives also learned that Williams had been traveling under another assumed name of, quote, Baron Swanston, end quote. Police finally located Baron Swanston in the small mining settlement of Southern Cross, where, upon his arrival, he took a job as an engineer in charge of machinery at the Fraser Gold Mine. Finally, on the day after Emily Williams had been laid to rest, police officers in Southern Cross wired Melbourne detectives Considine and Causey and they received a wire telegram from the area where Williams had been spotted that the police held the wiry suspect in their jail. Williams stated when police arrested him, I am innocent. I have never been to Windsor, to the best of my knowledge. I do not know where it is. After visiting the suspect in Southern Cross, Detectives Considine and Causey became more familiar with the man they knew as Druin, or Williams but later discovered his real name to be Frederick Bailey Deeming. Frederick Bailey Deeming was born on July 3, 1853 in Kent, England to respectable parents. At the age of 16, after an unsuccessful career as a petty thief, Deeming went to sea, where he earned a living committing small crimes and fraud under false pretenses. Deeming made it back to England in February 1890 where he bigamously married a woman named Miss Matheson, whom Deeming deserted later. At the time, he already had a wife and three children. At the time of this philandering, Deeming and his English wife were expecting their fourth child. At some point in this time, Deeming and his wife fought incessantly, culminating in her disappearance along with the four children, including the newborn child. Deeming explained that his wife was really his sister and she left to be with her sailor husband. Deeming fled the area and went to Australia in September 1891. He rented a house at number 57 Andrew Street in the Melbourne suburb of Windsor, from where Deeming disappeared in March 1891. Deeming made it a habit to prepare himself before moving to his next victim. In preparing himself for the murder of Emily Mather, known earlier to police as Emily Williams. 
Deeming met and became engaged to another woman, with the understanding that she would follow him wherever he traveled. Before Deeming left the house at 57 Andrew Street in the Windsor suburb of Melbourne, Australia, he paid the rent in advance and subsequently met his betrothed. Deeming was now, as they say, in the wind, at least until authorities captured the fugitive in Southern Cross. When the passengers on the ship that traveled from Perth in Western Australia to Melbourne with the Williamses gave their statements to police, there seemed a great disparity between any resemblance of the woman described as Deeming's wife and the woman found under the hearthstone at Andrew Street residence. More specifically, that Mrs. Williams appeared to be older and huskier than the woman found underneath the hearthstone, shorter with a darker complexion. Detectives Considine and Causey believed for a short time there were two Mrs. Deemings. Looking to investigate whether Deeming may have been responsible for other homicides, Considine and Causey found a dinner invitation from a small village located approximately 14 kilometers from Liverpool, England, known as Rainhill, at the Commercial Hotel. Authorities cabled Liverpool to investigate the dinner. Local police inquiries led them to a woman named Mrs. Mather, who owned a news agency. Mrs. Mather also happened to be the mother of Emily Williams Deeming, the young woman found beneath the cement on Andrew Street. Mrs. Mather collapsed when detectives informed her that they discovered her daughter's body. Mrs. Mather also stated that she rented property in the area as well, and the authorities should make inquiries into the property that Williams rented in Rain Hill. When police finally investigated the goings-on in Rain Hill, they discovered that a man matching Deeming's description rented a house named the Dineham Villa for his employer, a Colonel Brooks, whom Williams expected would be arriving in the area soon from India. The Colonel never materialized. When Deeming awaited the arrival of his alleged employer, he stayed very comfortably in the commercial hotel, and every night while there he went to the bar and regaled those who would listen with tales of his global travels. Deeming met Emily Mathers while in Rain Hill, and after a whirlwind courtship, the two were married on September 22, 1891. Before the two departed on a lavish honeymoon to Australia aboard the Kaiser Wilhelm II, Deeming held an expensive party while still owing thousands of pounds in bills to creditors in Rainhill and London. Before Deeming and his new bride left for Australia, residents in the area remembered the children who used to play around the Rainhill residence and then, all of a sudden, they were not there. After hearing several of his stories, local authorities in Liverpool made their way to the house and broke in. What they discovered was a most pungent odor, that of death. When they discovered the source of the malodorous aroma, authorities began digging at the fireplace. They used crowbars and shovels to get through the hearthstones and the earth beneath. To their horror, they uncovered the bodies of a woman and two children, all in an advanced state of decomposition. The corpses were wrapped in oilcloth. The woman lay upon her back, while the two children were turned with their faces downward lying one on each side of her. Even after authorities dug up the decomposing corpses, the smell still permeated throughout the house. In continued searches and digging, the police found two additional bodies, those of children, one, a small infant, and another small girl at the woman's feet. The woman and the nine-year-old girl were strangled, and the other children suffered throats that had been cut very deeply. As news of the discovery spread throughout England, two men came forward and identified the dead woman as Marie James, the wife of their brother, Frederick Deeming, and the children discovered underneath the hearthstone as being the children of Deeming and James. Deeming and his wife, Marie, returned from Australia with the young infant in tow and visited his brothers on the way to Rainhill. Since he returned, that was the last time they saw of their sibling and his family. With the discovery of the bodies at Rain Hill, just a short two weeks after the discovery of Emily Mather in Australia, police felt more pressed to interrogate Deeming than ever before. Authorities took Deeming under armed escort from Southern Cross to Perth for an extradition hearing. If successful, Deeming would return to Victoria in order to answer the charges of murder in the case of Emily Mather. 
during the five-day trip from Southern Cross to Perth, Deeming was said to have fainted three or four times and claimed a lack of appetite. Over the long journey, police escorts kept watch over him and never removed his handcuffs. When the train arrived at the small town of York, the town gathered around the station to, quote, see the man they heard slaughtered his entire family and a second wife, end quote. When Deeming stepped into the daylight, he raised his manacled arms and shouted, quote, ladies and gentlemen, you need not look at me. I am not guilty, but I have been victimized, end quote. At the next stop, Perth, the crowd grew so large waiting for the accused murderer that the train had to stop ahead of Perth and the prisoner was taken in a waiting van the rest of the way into the waterside lockup. When the prisoner arrived at the lockup, an inventory of his belongings contained a few photos, a silver case with Emily engraved upon the lid, a double photo frame with a photo of Deeming and the other side containing the photo of a cute six-year-old girl, and the last photo in the separate frame that contained the photo of a father, a mother, and three children. Interestingly, the inventory's trunk also contained a small timetable for trains to and from Rainhill and St. Helens Junction, and then the authorities inventoried a small battle axe with a very sharp blade, a mason's apron with the initials FBD monogrammed on the front of it, and a small common prayer book. Furthermore, the trunk contained a set of various knives. On March 24th, the Perth Police Court arraigned Deeming. His attorney, Richard Haynes, QC, desperately fought the extradition request, stating that his client would not receive a fair trial in Melbourne as, quote, the angry mob that had formed outside the Perth courthouse demonstrated, end quote, angered by the very thought that this prisoner actually murdered two women and four innocent children. The judge in the case took the argument under consideration and then granted the order of extradition. On March 27, 1892, deeming, Detective Causey, three armed police officers, and two reporters boarded the train to Midland Junction outside of Perth to make the 250-mile journey to Albany in southwest Australia with the ship SS Ballarat for the next leg of the journey to Melbourne. On their first stop, the train took on more coal and water. What the police escorts were unaware of was that someone telegraphed ahead to alert the population at the stop that the train contained the accused killer. By the time the train arrived in York, a large crowd stood ready to confront the prisoner. Many of the women in the crowd yelled, quote, lynch him, end quote, quote, drag him out, end quote, and pull him out by the bullocks, end quote. The armed escort and Detective Causey became so concerned as to whether there would be any extra legal action that the shutters on Deeming's car had to be closed in order to conceal his location on the train. At this point in time, the crowd, not fooled at the concealment, pushed on the train and someone from the other side threw a brick through the window. Deeming became very scared and begged the officers in the compartment to protect him from the maddened ensemble. The train then pulled from the station, headed to the next stop. On their way to the next stop, Deeming seemed to have a, quote, fit, end quote, so to speak, where he thrashed around violently to the point where it took four men to hold him down until the conniption subsided. With his head badly bruised and swollen from the episode, the officers determined that Deeming may have tried to escape with this fit, but when he saw that it failed, he resigned himself to his fate. When the train finally arrived in Albany, the police escorts made sure that the incidents that occurred at pass stops did not occur when they arrived near the prison. The prisoner transfer occurred without any further incident. Detective Causey and other officers planned to stay in the jail overnight, transporting the prisoner the following morning to the SS Ballarat, finally making their way to Melbourne. When they awoke the next morning to take charge of their prisoner, the guards noticed something very odd. The attribute that eventually led to Deeming's capture was gone, shaved off of the prisoner's face with the edge of a broken medicine bottle found in the cell. Later, guards discovered that Deeming plucked 75% of the hairs from his face before using the broken bottle to shave the rest. Deeming accomplished this even under the watchful eyes of round-the-clock surveillance in his cell to make sure that he did not harm himself. Detective Causey expressed concern regarding the removal of Deeming's mustache 
as it altered his appearance greatly and would have helped the prosecution's case. Now, the prisoner looked completely different. When the party arrived in Adelaide, the officers guarding Deeming learned that a large crowd already gathered at the docks waiting for the suspect. Rather than attempt to board a train with their charge and risk his abduction and lynching, Detective Causey and the other officers decided to take the ship all the way to Melbourne. When the journey continued, Detective Causey noted that Deeming became very moody and began to comprehend the hatred and animus toward him. Deeming stated to one of the police escorts, quote, They might wait until I'm found guilty. Many innocent men have been hanged. I'm not afraid to die. If I have to die, I die like a man. But first I'll make sure some revelation that will astonish the world. End quote. On April 2nd, 1892, at approximately 9 a.m., the Ballarat anchored in Port Phillip Bay, and the police escort immediately brought Deeming to the police court where he stood for the charge of murdering Emily Mather Williams. When asked to give his name, Deeming refused to answer the court and therefore the court charged him under the name of Albert Williams. Deeming's trial began on May 2, 1892 in Melbourne, Australia. The defense counsel alleged that the defendant was insane at the time of the crimes. However, Six mental health professionals examined Deeming at the time, some as many as six examinations, and none of them could state with any certainty that Deeming was, in fact, insane. The trial lasted a total of four days, and the evidence appeared beyond a reasonable doubt that Deeming murdered Emily Mather. When other medical doctors testified, they stated that Deeming suffered from epileptic fits that may have been caused by his advanced infection of venereal disease that may have, certainly, affected his mind and thinking processes. Doctors mentioned that Deeming exhibited moodiness, was, quote, loquacious and fantasized about his past, end quote. The defendant even went so far to say that his dead mother ordered him to kill wife Emily Mather and that, quote, Sometimes he had been overwhelmed by the irresistible impulse to slaughter the current lady in his life. End quote. A prison physician, Dr. Shields, presented his findings to the court when he testified, I have frequently conversed with him but cannot believe anything he says. As to whether Dr. Shields believed that Deeming knew the difference between right and wrong, Dr. Shields added, That stealing, for example, was a matter of conscience. Murder also permissible in certain circumstances. Dr. Shields concluded by saying that Deeming related that often he would go out at night armed with a pistol to kill the women that gave him venereal disease. Deeming, who always believed that grandstanding was the best method to get people to believe him, took the stand in his own defense. The gallery exhibited fascination with the man in front of them who may have been responsible for the murder of six people, including four children. The accused sometimes closed his eyes as he related how the public prejudged him before the trial. With this publicity in mind, Deeming asked the jury if there were 200 people in Australia that would not convict him. Deeming then went on to say that Emily Mather was not dead. The defendant continued to profess his innocence throughout the testimony. Although there may have been some sympathy throughout the beginning of his testimony, that sympathy died quickly as Deeming bragged about his travels and exhibited, quote, an insatiable ego, end quote, with his descriptions. The impression that Deeming left with the gallery and jurors was one of a sane man obsessed with his own existence and the ability to eliminate any person who got in his way from achieving even the most deviant desires, that with the fairer sex. The ruse that Deeming tried to portray fell short of the mercy the jury was willing to give in this case. The verdict they rendered was guilty. After a failed appeal to the Privy Council, Deming was hanged at the Melbourne Gall on May 23, 1892. After death had been certified, prison officials shaved the hair from Deeming's head and face and then made a death mask. On the next day, Prison officials moved Deeming's body to an unmarked grave at the Old Melbourne Gall, then moved his body to another unmarked grave at the Pentridge Gall.
On February 11, 1911, in Crowley, Louisiana, just west of Lafayette, authorities found the bodies of Walter J. Byers, his wife, and their young child murdered in their home. Investigators surmise that the perpetrator of the crime entered the residence of the decedents through the rear window of the abode. The Byers residence stood in one of the poorest sections of town where black families congregated and where those who lived there any length of time had grown accustomed to the violence that frequently occurred there. Upon closer examination of the bodies, investigators surmise that the Byers family, quote, had been brained with an ax, end quote. Police commented at the ferocity of such a crime as this one. But this brought to the forefront a killer of such daring that local authorities never dreamed this series would grow increasingly more volatile. Almost two weeks later, on the morning of February 24, 1911, in Lafayette, Louisiana, proper, Nina Martin sat at the kitchen table of her house, having just been awakened by the crow of the morning rooster. At approximately 7 a.m. that morning, Nina's son, Lazimi Felix, burst open the door to the front of the shack, ran in, obviously out of breath, stating that her sister and brother-in-law had just been brutally murdered. Nina then went to his sister's cabin, and when she opened the door, she discovered a scene of almost indescribable gore. Alexander Andrus, his wife, Mimi, and their two children, Joachim and Agnes, lay dead in one bed with a bloody axe on the floor near the foot of the bed. Upon further examination of the dead bodies, the coroner of Lafayette Parish stated that the family of four was slaughtered, quote, at the hands of a party or parties unknown, end quote. On March 22, 1911, near Beaumont, Texas, Louis Cassaway, his wife and their three children, suffered the exact same injuries as the Andruses. Their bodies were badly beaten and their skulls crushed with an ax. There was one exception. Where the victims in Louisiana were all black, Cassaway's wife was white. Authorities in Beaumont believed that the killer did not agree with the mixed couples and killed the entire family as a result of that anger. After hearing about the Cassaway murders, Lafayette Parish Sheriff Louis Lacoste took more of a personal interest in the murders that occurred closer to home and developed his own theory of the crimes. Sheriff Lacoste believed that the killer to be a man of some local criminal renown by the name of Raymond Barnabet, a middle-aged black man who lived in the area. Sheriff Lacoste went to the Barnabet residence and immediately arrested Raymond for the Byers and Andrus's murders. The chief lawman also believed that Barnabet was responsible for the Cassaway murders as well. But unfortunately, Sheriff Lacoste lacked the evidence to even hold Barnabet, so he released him. But a few days later, Sheriff Lacoste returned to the Barnabet residence and re-arrested Raymond Barnabet. In October of that year, a grand jury indicted Barnabet for the Byers and Andrus's murders. On October 19, 1911, Raymond Barnabet stood trial for murder. During the course of the preliminary investigations for the prosecution, questioning of the defendant produced leads that otherwise would have eluded authorities. Testifying for the prosecution, Nina Porter, Barnabet's common-law wife, and his two children, Zephyrin and Clementine, took the stand. Nina Porter testified that Raymond Barnabet left their home and boarded a train on the night of the murders around 7 p.m., stating that he traveled to Broussard, Louisiana, just a short little trip from their residence and, quote, jumped, end quote, a train heading that way. According to Porter, Barnabet wore a blue shirt or jumper. He did not arrive back home until 2 a.m. the next morning, and Barnabet became angry when he discovered that Porter saved him no dinner. Barnabet got more agitated when he learned that he lost his smoking pipe during the trip. Without food and his favorite pipe, Barnabet went to sleep. When his 17-year-old daughter, Clementine, took the stand, she gave a much different version of the story about what happened the night of the Andrus murders. Clementine testified that her father returned home much later than Porter stated. The daughter stated that her father did not return home until closer to sunrise of the next morning. Upon his return, Barnabet, according to his daughter, wore the same shirt in which he left the house the evening before. 
When he arrived the next morning, Clementine stated that Raymond Barnabet walked all over the house smoking the very pipe that he claimed he lost the night before. His clothes appeared to be covered in blood and brain matter, and Clementine stated that she washed the clothes to get out the stains. Clementine also stated that her father demanded his dinner because he just murdered a whole family and threatened Zephyrin, his son, and Clementine that if they mentioned a word as to what happened, he would kill them. When son Zephyrin testified, he stated that he witnessed his father enter the home with an undershirt and a pair of trousers with a lot of blood and brain matter attached to it. Zephyrin testified that his father demanded that he retrieve his dinner and yelled at the young man that he, quote, killed the whole damn Andrus family, end quote. After making that statement in front of the court, he turned to the judge and strongly suggested that the judge find a way to keep his father behind bars, quote, due to his violent and threatening behavior at the time of the murder and in the past, end quote. The prosecution called the whole of the Stevens family, neighbors of the Barnabets, to testify in court. In an effort to prevent an attack on the Stevens' credibility, a local newspaper stated that the prosecution put into the record that the Stevens family were, quote, representatives of the best of their race, were clean, modest, direct, and uncontradictory, end quote. The Barnabets, specifically Zephyrin and Clementine, had been characterized by local law enforcement as, quote, filthy, shifty, degenerate examples of the lowest African type, end quote. Sheriff Lacoste, for one, believed the siblings knew more about the murders than they led law enforcement to believe. After a very short trial, a jury of all whites convicted Raymond Barnabet of the murders of the Andrus and Byers families. This conviction stood, at least for the time being, as a result of Zephyrin and Clementine's testimony. But still, police questioned the motives of the siblings in presenting such damning evidence against their father. The defense filed a motion for a new trial and claimed that Raymond Barnabet was drunk during the proceedings, therefore not competent in helping his counsel demonstrate a proper defense, that the jury failed to follow the judge's instructions at deliberation, and that the prosecution failed to introduce a motive for the murders. The appellate court agreed and granted Raymond Barnabet a new trial. While Barnabet waited in the Lafayette jail for his second day in court, on the morning of November 27, 1911, again in Lafayette, Louisiana, police discovered the bodies of Norbert Randall, his wife, Azima, and their four children, Renee Randall, aged six, Norbert Jr., aged five, Agnes Randall, aged two, and Albert Sice, aged eight, in their small cabin on Lafayette Street, all of them lying on two beds in the same room, quote, fearfully mutilated, end quote. When Sheriff Lacoste arrived at the scene, he noticed an axe leaning against a wall near the foot of the bed, which the killer obviously washed of all blood. Later information came to light that Norbert Randall, in addition to suffering other injuries, also sustained a gunshot wound to the head. Because of the scenes in the Byers, Andrus, and Randall murders, and the number of victims left behind, investigators theorized that more than one killer must have been involved. And although the murders took place at different locations, the police suspected that all of these murders, somehow, were connected. Later in the day of the Randall murders, acting on a hunch, Sheriff Lacoste located Clementine Barnabet at a friend's house, and after using the restroom, Sheriff Lacoste passed a dress on the way to the living room that appeared to have been stained with blood and brain matter. The lawman immediately arrested the teenager and charged her with murder. Police also arrested her brother, Zephyrin, as an accessory to the crimes, along with two other men, Edwin Charles and Gregory Porter. When detectives began their interrogation of Clementine, she laughed uncontrollably, as if she sought to demonstrate a mental defect, but then she stated she had nothing to do with the murders. Authorities continued believing that Clementine knew more than she professed to the interrogators and held her for more questioning. Zephyrin maintained he had an alibi for the nights in question, but until investigators could positively confirm his whereabouts, he remained in Lafayette jail along with Edwin Charles and Gregory Porter. In order to establish a more solid connection to the murders, Sheriff Lacoste sent 
Clementine's clothing to a chemist in New Orleans. Granted, the only thing at that time and at that particular stage of forensics a chemist would be able to do is to establish whether the blood contained on the clothing was human or animal. Even though Sheriff Lacoste may have been able to convince Clementine that her clothes contained blood from the three series of murders as a ruse, the fact remained that the forensic tests would not be able to reveal the identity of the person or persons murdered. Even with the knowledge that the clothing was sent to a chemist, Clementine sat during her long interrogations with deputies and Sheriff Lacoste maintaining, quote, a sphinx-like attitude, end quote. Several people stated that Clementine wandered the streets at night and was nowhere near the scene of the murders. Still, Clementine offered no explanation as to how the blood smeared her clothing. One of the theories of the crime placed Clementine at the scene of the Randall murder after having picked up an axe on the way to the family's residence. Clementine allegedly attacked Norbert Randall first, instantly killing him, then attacking Azima Randall, also killing her instantly. Then she went after the children. The coroner later confirmed that Norbert Randall had been shot in the head post-mortem, but authorities failed to find the pistol. Investigators, although they believed Clementine Barnabet played an essential part in the murders of all the families, they still postulated that she could not have committed the murders alone, nor could law enforcement figure out the motive to wipe out three whole families, four if the cassaways were included. As the investigation matured, detectives dug deeper into Clementine's past and determined, after reconsidering the crime scenes as a whole, that the murders looked convincingly like they were religiously inspired. Because they believed Clementine to be the principal perpetrator, Sheriff Lacoste ordered the release of Zephyrin, Edwin Charles, and Gregory Porter. Clementine and Raymond still sat in the Lafayette jail. Sheriff Lacoste subsequently discovered that a cult existed within his parish. This revelation came to light when investigators learned that the victims belonged to a fringe church known as the, quote, Church of Sacrifice, end quote, under the tutelage of Reverend King Harris, where church members were, quote, so intensely moved and impressed by the teaching of the Testament, sacrificial ideas, and ceremonies that they were incited to commit heinous crimes, end quote. Although Sheriff Lacoste strongly believed the two responsible for the rash of murders occurring in Louisiana and Texas were secured tightly within his jail, on January 18, 1912, in the town of Crowley, in an area known to locals as the, quote, promised land, end quote, Harriet Crane looked across the street from her residence to a house occupied by her daughter, Marie Warner. Crane noticed that even at this late time of the day, it was approximately noon. She saw no activity whatsoever at the house. Marie Warner had three small children, and Crane thought this very bizarre indeed. When Crane stepped outside of her residence, she saw one of her close neighbors, Dorney Birdsong, and asked him if he had seen either Warner or the children. Crane and Birdsong then walked across the street to the Warner residence to check for any signs of activity. The pair walked around the back of the residence and too frightened to go in, they stopped another neighbor, Ben Robinson, to go inside and see if the family had awakened. With much hesitation, Robinson finally entered the Warner shack and discovered, quote, the mangled remains of four occupants on a bed in the front room, end quote. In addition to Marie Warner, her three children, Pearl, aged nine, Gary, aged seven, and Harriet, aged two. The police arrived quickly after being summoned to the residence. When they examined the crime scene more closely, they discovered a blood-stained axe in the same room with the victims, and also discovered two sets of foot tracks in the mud, as it had rained the night before. At first, police utilized the bloodhounds to track the killers, but later called off the search when the dogs lost the scent. Three days later, on January 21, 1912, in a residence located at 331 Rock Street in Lake Charles, Louisiana, authorities discovered the bodies of Felix Broussard, quote, an industrious man who was without enemies, end quote, his wife and their three children, all under the age of eight, and all had their skulls crushed and mangled by the axe blows. Investigators found the murder weapon underneath the adult's bed. 
The perpetrators gained entrance to the residence through the kitchen window. But this time, the killer, or killers, left more clues as to their identities. On the front door of the residence, there appeared a Bible transcription written in blood that read, When he maketh the acquisition for blood, he forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Next to the inscription, also scrawled in blood, read, quote, Human Five, end quote. To add to the bloodthirsty signature of the killer or killers, police also found a bucket under the bed of the children placed there, obviously, to catch the blood as it ran from their wounds. Immediately after the Broussard murders, in an attempt to ascertain the operations of this supposed cult, Sheriff Lacoste arrested Reverend King Harris and brought him to the jail for questioning. The lawman did this not only for the suspect's protection, but also to delve into the mysterious teaching that would cause followers to murder others in the name of God. Even though Clementine and Zephyrin sat in the Lafayette jail, Sheriff Lacoste believed that other followers perpetuated the mantra of the cult and continued their bloody work. Reverend Harris cooperated fully with Sheriff Lacoste and stated that the Church of Sacrifice was an unofficial sect of the Christ-sanctified Holy Church located in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Nothing in what has been sermonized within his church would condone, nor would there be any messages causing the followers to commit the crimes that had been committed in the most recent months. Another preacher suffered the interrogations of Sheriff Lacoste as well. But the dutiful sheriff failed to retrieve any more useful information out of the most recent suspect. Both men walked out of the jail shaken, but free. After all the crimes that had been committed, Sheriff Lacoste faced a frightened and angered population. The black populations of Crowley, Rain, Lafayette, and Lake Charles looked to the sheriff for protection and whether they have gotten any closer to catching the mysterious killer or killers. One of the residents, a black businessman known as Deshotel, received what could only be called a, quote, black hand letter, end quote. This was a well-known missive used by the Mafia to extort money from a chosen victim. Deshotel's letter stated, Eat well and drink well in preparation for the death which will overtake him. This message was allegedly written in blood. Although the threat failed to materialize, a wholesale panic ensued within the black populations of the region. The black citizens of Brobridge, Louisiana, a small farming community located just east of Lafayette acted fearful that the axe murderer may visit them in the middle of the night. The entire black population of Brobridge stayed awake at night with loaded weapons, waiting for the axe fiend to appear. No one knew who was next. On February 11, 1912, blacks in the region decided to take matters into their own hands. 150 of them met at the Good Hope Baptist Church in Lafayette. There, all those present stated that they would, quote, render all assistance in our possession to authorities and officers of our city in bringing to justice the perpetrators of these crimes, end quote. The group further resolved to supply any and all information necessary to apprehend those responsible, as well as act in the capacity as law enforcement officers in certain situations. What was more important, the group gave thanks to the white population of Lafayette for their, quote, guidance and support, end quote. Increased patrols around the region by several law enforcement departments had a calming effect on the population. The involvement of other departments and local witnesses seemed to allay fears of those residents in the region. Authorities could only hope that members of this cult would discontinue the series of murders with their two leaders sitting behind bars. Although the patrols may have deterred any followers of the, quote, Church of Sacrifice, end quote, from committing murders in southwestern Louisiana, it seemed that some followers in Texas refused to relent. On February 20, 1912, nine days after the community meeting, at a residence located at 1428 Cable Street in the north end of Beaumont, Texas, police discovered the bodies of Hattie Dove, 26, Ernie Dove, 14, Ethel Dove, 16, and Jamie Quirk. The bodies displayed signs of the previous murders and police held no doubt that the same person or persons were responsible for the rampage. Somehow, the police believed, 
Clementine and her father provided guidance to her followers as to whom to murder and where. Sheriff Lacoste received a letter that gave some indication as to how the murder still continued even though the leaders sat in jail. It appeared that one leader in the Church of Sacrifice, possibly a lieutenant of the Barnabets, went through the region choosing victims. When Sheriff Lacoste first arrested Clementine, she denied any knowledge surrounding the murders that had been committed at that time. But two weeks after the Dove murders, Clementine surprised everyone when she made a wholesale confession to being responsible for the murders and shared, quote, insights with authorities regarding how she came to participate in such a murderous lifestyle, end quote. Clementine also related to Sheriff Lacoste where she was born and how she came into a life of what she called, quote, degradation, end quote. Clementine also related how she became involved with voodoo. Louisiana had long been infamous for the ritualistic practices of this religion, but Clementine Barnabet believed that the ancient practices could help her accomplish more sinister objectives. On a visit to New Iberia, Clementine, along with two other women and two men, met an old black woman that showed them the way of, quote, hoodoo, end quote, and bought some, quote, conja bags, end quote, from the conjurer. Conja bags were said to be small sacks that contained herbs and animal parts for various spells. Clementine claimed that the old woman claimed that the conja bags would protect Clementine and her accomplices from discovery by the police should they desire to commit a crime. Clementine sought to test the old woman's claim by traveling to Rain, Louisiana, dressed as a man. She stole an axe from an unknown person and proceeded to commit her first murder. In her lengthy confession, Clementine stated, I saw the mother sleeping on the bed. Then I decided I would enter the house and there begin the work which we had planned. On entering the house, I struck the woman on the right temple and killed her instantly. One of the children was awakened by the noise and before he could raise his head from the pillow, I struck a blow somewhere near the left ear. Then I struck the other two. I left the man's clothes which I wore in the house and left in the women's clothes returned to my sister's house, and later during the same night, I boarded a train for Lafayette, arriving here about midnight. During the rest of her confession, Clementine stated that she used a gun only once when she murdered Norbert Randall and recalled every grisly detail of her murders in front of the investigators. The confessed murderer said that the gender of her victims was of no import. Authorities believe that even though others may have executed their crimes, Raymond, Clementine and Zephyrin, later rearrested, vicariously led the killers to their prey. Clementine claimed she killed the children so that they would not be orphans. In testifying against her father, Clementine claimed she just wanted to continue her work and her brother suggested that she testify. At the time, Clementine maintained that she and she alone was responsible for the murders. Lafayette Parish District Attorney Howard E. Bruner formulated a theory where he believed that the Texas murders were committed, though a copycat killer rather than any of the members of the church sacrifice were responsible. Bruner characterized Clementine as, quote, a moral pervert and gave her little credit for her attempts to involve another and probably mythical person, end quote. The story of a teenage girl traveled all over the country and made headlines all over the world. What some people could not fathom was how did a teenage girl, with no education, conduct a series of murders committed by either herself or her followers without being detected. Succinctly, citizens following the story displayed disbelief that someone so young could be that diabolical. But Sheriff Lacoste, listening to Clementine's confession, deemed the mystical fanaticism angle to the murders as impossible and, quote, place no credence in Clementine's hoodoo version and many other of her illusory flights of imagination in giving her confession, end quote. On April 4, 1912, D.A. Bruner filed charges against Clementine Barnabet for the murders of the Randall family. Newspapers attributed more than 35 murders to the young murderess, but still unproven. Sheriff Lacoste, in the meantime, traveled to New Iberia and arrested Joseph Thibodeau, the man who allegedly constructed the conja bags. Thibodeau was not an, quote, old woman, end quote, as Clementine first confessed. 
Clementine later identified Thibodeau as the man who sold her and her party the conja bags when deputies at the Lafayette jail brought him to her cell. Another lawman, a Crowley, Louisiana Sheriff Fontenot, remained skeptical of Clementine's guilt as he cited her confessions and the many inconsistencies that came to light. Sheriff Fontenot did not consider her to be a viable suspect. While the investigators pursued further leads, another murder occurred outside of the jurisdiction of Louisiana law enforcement, but carried some of the same signatures of the Louisiana murders. On April 12, 1912, authorities discovered the mutilated bodies of William Barton, his wife, their two children, and Barton's brother-in-law, Leon Avers. Investigators determined that these murders were not the result of a copycat. The crime scene closely resembled those of the Louisiana murders, with one addition that law enforcement did not mention for fear of generating further panic. Like the Louisiana murders, the children murdered each had their fingers separated on their hands with small pegs of wood. The meaning of this particular facet never became clear, but for the killer or killers to take the time to meticulously place pegs between the children's fingers, this left no doubt that the same killer or killers were responsible for the Randall murders as well as the ones committed in Louisiana. With all of the publicity and the wearing down of Zephyrin and Raymond Barnabet, Zephyrin confessed that he and his father murdered the Andrus family with Clementine and two men, Ute and Darman Thomas, and one woman who assisted as an accessory. Sheriff Lacoste arrested these suspects as well. As law enforcement tried to gather more evidence in preparing for the trials of the Barnabets, it appeared the followers of the Church of Sacrifice continued their bloody, quote, work, end quote. On August 20th, 1912, the assailant entered the Dashleel family home through a kitchen window and attacked Mrs. Dashleel first, striking her in the area of her head, or so he thought. Mrs. Dashleel raised her arm to block the blow. When the assailant tried a second time, the axe fell on her right foot, causing a superficial wound. Her screams alerted neighbors, who then called the police. Sales of pistols continued to soar, and stores soon ran out of ammunition for various firearms. Black citizens, although they appeared to be the most prepared for attacks, took little solace that Clementine, Zephyrin, and Raymond would face trial soon. On October 16, 1912, Clementine's attorneys moved before the court to have their client examined by psychiatrists, citing her behavior at the time of her arrest, the merciless and unfeeling way she acted in front of Sheriff Lacoste. Defense attorneys had reason to believe that Clementine exhibited signs of insanity and, as is the job of defense attorneys, they zealously fought for psychiatric examinations. And, she not be brought to trial herein until the question of her mental condition and her consequent moral and legal accountability or non-accountability for her acts and her statements. Subsequently, three psychiatrists from New Orleans examined the teen and determined that Clementine, although she may be, quote, morally deprived, usually ignorant, and of low-grade mentality, end quote, was not insane as per the insanity protocols of the day. As the trial commenced from the alienist's findings, the prosecution admitted Clementine's confession and all the evidence that pointed to her guilt, especially in the Randall murders. On the following day, after a brief deliberation, the jury found Clementine Barnabet guilty of murder and sentenced her to life in the state penitentiary in Angola, Louisiana. Although those paying close attention to the case cast no doubts that the teen would receive the death penalty, because of her age, 17, the jury recommended life imprisonment and the judge complied. With the supposed leader of the Church of Sacrifice sentenced to prison for the rest of her life, on November 22, 1912, in the small Mississippi town of Philadelphia, a hundred miles northeast of Jackson, authorities discovered the bodies of William Walmsley, his wife, and their four-year-old child, murdered with an axe. The family proved to have once been members of the Church of Sacrifice and left some time before the murders began. Police were left with no clues to the identities of the killer or killers. As the new year of 1913 approached, the murders seemed to cease. 
Historical sources are not clear as to whether the accomplices to these series of murders ever stood trial or conviction. Zephyrin and Raymond Barnabet were released from jail and never really heard from again. After Clementine began her incarceration, prison officials assigned her as a cane cutter in the fields surrounding the prison. In 1913, Clementine attempted to escape, but prison officials captured her not too long after that. In 1923, Clementine left the prison, never to be seen or heard from again. The question remains for historians and criminologists alike. How did someone who committed such heinous murders manage to only serve 10 years for her crimes? The answer lies in the Louisiana legislature. In 1902, they passed an act that allowed for the commutation or the diminishing of life sentences if the individual requesting that particular relief could demonstrate he or she had abided by the rules of the prison system and deserved clemency. With the exception of the attempted escape just after her arrival to the prison, Clementine became a model prisoner. The legend of Clementine Barnabet, like other legends, grew in popularity. Even though her fate has not been documented, Clementine's presence in history did not resurface until an obscure blog mentioned her name in a story that was submitted by someone named, quote, Voodoo Gal 11, end quote, sometime in 2010. This young lady claimed that she went to visit her great-grandmother for her hundredth birthday. The young lady sat and listened to her great-grandmother as she remembered the story of Clementine Barnabet, taking in every detail as if the centenarian were actually a witness to the crimes at the times they occurred. The great-grandmother pointed to a merciless detail that some history books seemed to have left out that Clementine used to beat her suitors with a whip and if they could withstand the beating, she would allow the courtship to continue. Unfortunately, it seemed that several of the anxious young men gave up any fondness for the teenager after they learned the conditions of the mistreatment. The great-grandmother related the story with all calmness and matter-of-factness, sipping her iced tea when she continued to add details. Later that year, Voodoo Gal 11 received news that her great-grandmother passed away. She traveled to southwestern Louisiana for the funeral. There she met her aunt and asked if she could see a photo of her great-grandmother as a young woman. In the words of the storyteller, upon viewing the likeness, she had alabaster skin, long curly black hair, and very light eyes, and then I started trembling. The storyteller then realized that in viewing the photograph in front of her, chillingly, that her great-grandmother was, in fact, Clementine Barnabet. Although Voodoo Gal 11 merely presented the story without any proof whatsoever, it gave the reader something to think about. On an unusually cold night in Los Angeles, California in February 1922, even though Prohibition had been in full force and effect for the last three years, famed Hollywood director William Desmond Taylor and movie star Mabel Normand shared orange blossom gin cocktails early in the evening and enjoyed some small talk. The two often shared each other's company when they discussed the events of the day, Nietzsche, Freud, and the business in which they shared motion pictures. At approximately 7.45 p.m., Taylor walked Norman to her car where the chauffeur waited dutifully. As the car drove off, Norman blew kisses to Taylor and he responded in kind. Taylor walked back to his bungalow located on Alvarado Street 
opened the door and walked inside. This was the last time that Norman, or anyone else for that matter, saw Taylor alive. At approximately 8 p.m. on that evening, neighbors reported that they heard what sounded like a car backfire. Faith McLean, one of the residents in Taylor's building, walked over to her window and thought she saw a man with a long coat wearing a muffler or with his collar turned up and a plaid cap covering his face. The man then turned and looked back at McLean, returning to Taylor's residence as if he had forgotten something. Ten years later, the woman claimed she could not positively identify the man. Another neighbor, Hazel Gillen, stated that she saw the man walking from the complex after she heard the car backfire. At approximately 7.30 a.m. the next morning, Taylor's house servant, Henry Peavy, arrived at his employer's bungalow. When Peavy walked through the door, he called to Taylor and received no answer. When he walked further into the apartment, he found Taylor lying dead in the living room. Peavy yelled really loudly and then ran into the courtyard of the bungalow. The first entity that Peavy called was the studio that Taylor worked for rather than the police. When the investigators finally arrived, 12 hours after Peavy's discovery of the body, they thought that Taylor may have died from natural causes until they turned the body over and discovered Taylor lying in a pool of blood. The death of Taylor created even more of a scandal than what Hollywood needed at the time. The year before, Comedian Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle stood accused of the rape and murder of a young Hollywood starlet with the reputation of being a very amenable party girl. Therefore, after the discovery of Taylor's body, studio executives wanted any unsavory revelations to remain at a minimum. In fact, when the police finally arrived, they noticed that there were studio executives at Taylor's bungalow burning papers in the fireplace. When police questioned the various witnesses, Investigators held a great deal of interest in Mabel Norman. Norman stated that she visited Taylor just briefly to have a drink and then to borrow two books from the victim. Norman made it clear that Taylor expressed worry regarding his former secretary, Edward Sands, who disappeared after forging checks in the director's name and whom Taylor had to bail out of jail after he solicited young boys in a local park. Additionally, once the news hit the papers, Rumors began to fly regarding sex parties and open drug use. As far as the police were concerned, the murder appeared to be a love triangle gone wrong with Mabel Norman and a young starlet named Mary Miles Minter to be in the center of the controversy. In cases such as this, vicious gossip is accepted as fact. With that in mind, more innuendo intimated that Norman and Taylor belonged to an occult group known as the Ordo Templis Orientis. This cult was led by the renowned Satanist Aleister Crowley. Additionally, rumors also spread that Taylor frequented an opium den where men would smoke the eastern drug and had sexual relations with each other. Some hypothesized that Taylor's death was the result of a homosexual revenge killing. One of the most interesting facets of the case emerged just two days after the discovery of Taylor's body. William Desmond Taylor was not really William Desmond Taylor. His real name was William Cunningham Dean Tanner. Details revealed that Tanner was once a traveling actor, gold prospector, and antique dealer in the early 1900s. Tanner married a woman named Ethel May Harrison, and they had a daughter. In 1908, Tanner abandoned his family, and his wife never heard from him until 1919, when she viewed a movie where the actor she recognized as her husband was billed under the name of William Desmond Taylor. When assessing the investigation, authorities realized there were a great deal of suspects that had access to the victim at the time of the murder. One of the strongest suspects, a Charlotte Shelby, was the mother of Mary Miles Minter and became incensed with Taylor when she learned that he deflowered her daughter. Additionally, a stack of love letters written between Mabel Normand and Taylor disappeared during the course of the investigation. Taylor referred to Norman as Blessed Baby as a pet name for her whenever he wrote letters to her. The famous creator of the Keystone Cops and Hollywood director in his own right, Max Sennett, was questioned by the police and investigators, and even though they considered him a prime suspect, police later removed Sennett from consideration. When the investigators searched Taylor's clothing, 
They located a wallet holding $78, approximately $1,000 in today's currency, a silver cigarette case, a Waltham pocket watch, a pen knife, and a locket bearing the photo of Mabel Norman. The investigators also found a two-carat diamond ring on his finger. Because of the valuables still present, authorities immediately ruled out robbery as a motive. However, a large amount of cash that Taylor kept in the bungalow was missing and had never been accounted for up until the present day. When the authorities continued to interview Mary Miles Minter, she stated that another director, actor, friend of Taylor stated to her that Taylor made several delusional statements the weeks before his death and that Taylor may have been going insane. At this point, all of the Hollywood studios expressed concern and downright anger that if the facts surrounding Taylor's death ever became public, people would lose their jobs, sexual proclivities would be exposed, and more importantly, stockholders would lose millions of dollars. What knowledge could one man possibly have that could have caused so much destruction? Because of the great interest in the case across the country, Authorities had more than enough suspects in the murder of William Desmond Taylor. Edward F. Sands, mentioned earlier in this presentation, held a criminal record where he stood convicted of embezzlement, forgery, and serial desertion from the U.S. military. Sands worked as Taylor's valet, cook, and general all-around handyman. Sands frequently stole from Taylor while in the director's employ, including forging some checks in the director's name. After Taylor fired the former convict, Sands went back to Taylor's bungalow and robbed him again, leaving footprints on Taylor's bed when he left the residence. Sands disappeared from history, and some historians claimed that his body was found in the Sacramento River in the early 1930s. Henry Peavy surfaced as another suspect who also had a criminal record. Peavy had been arrested three days before Taylor's murder for vagrancy and lewd and dissolute behavior. Peavy took over after Taylor fired Sands and was the person who discovered Taylor's body on the morning after the murder. Taylor was slated to appear on Peavy's behalf in court on February 2, 1922, but unfortunately, someone murdered him. Authorities questioned Peavy extensively, but noted he provided no evidence whatsoever to the murder itself. Some reporters believed that Peavy knew more than he stated to police and reporters and they decided to kidnap him in order to exact a confession. The ploy did not work. Peavy left Los Angeles for San Francisco a few months after the murder. In 1930, Peavy was confined to the Napa State Hospital with an advanced case of general paresis, venereal disease related to dementia, from a case of advanced syphilis. Henry Peavy died of advanced tertiary syphilis in December of 1931. One of the more obvious suspects, Mabel Norman, began a relationship with Taylor when Norman believed that Taylor could help her with her cocaine addiction. Whenever Norman experienced frequent relapses, it appeared that Taylor would become despondent over her struggle. One of the motives that investigators suspected may have strongly been the reason for Taylor's death is that he may have met with federal investigators to give them information on Norman's cocaine suppliers. Norman's dealers may have learned of the meeting and ended Taylor's life due to his willingness to end their business. Taylor must have suspected that he placed his life in danger for wanting to end Norman's suffering, as well as ending some of the drug trade in 1920s Hollywood. Norman may also have suspected who may have been the killers, but kept quiet. On the night of the murder, Norman left Taylor's residence at approximately 7.45 p.m. in what has been described as a happy mood. When she left Taylor's residence, she carried a book in her hand and little did she know that would be the last person to see Taylor alive. After a long and arduous interrogation, investigators no longer considered Norman to be a viable suspect. During Taylor's funeral, Norman wept openly. Her life continued as Norman made more films in Hollywood throughout the 1920s, but she died of tuberculosis on February 23, 1930. On her deathbed, Norman asked a friend, do you ever think they'll find out who killed Bill Taylor? One of Taylor's neighbors 
Faith Cole McLean, lived in the same building as Taylor along with her husband, actor Douglas McLean. Authorities believe that Mrs. McLean saw Taylor's killer and could identify him or her. At approximately 8 p.m. on February 1, 1922, McLean stated that she and her husband were startled by a noise and when she went to investigate, she opened the front door of their bungalow and spotted a man dressed like my idea of a motion picture burglar. Mrs. McLean stated that the person walked out of Taylor's bungalow and then immediately turned around and headed back into the bungalow as stated previously, as if he forgot something when leaving Taylor's residence. When she finally got to see what the mystery person looked like, she said it appeared as though the person was wearing makeup and walked effeminately as if the person was not a man at all. Police also expressed interest in a studio executive named Charles Eiton, general manager of Paramount Studios. Eiton and several representatives of the studio entered the Taylor bungalow after the murder and removed items that proved compromising to both Taylor and the studio. Eiton accomplished this either before the police arrived or immediately after they entered the bungalow with police permission. As mentioned previously, Authorities considered Mary Miles Minter a suspect, but after a lengthy interrogation, removed her from the suspect list. Love letters from Minter to Taylor had been discovered in the bungalow and demonstrated that the young girl, 19 years old at the time of the alleged affair, was smitten with Taylor. Newspaper reporters alleged that a sexual relationship existed between the director and Mary Miles Minter but this has been historically discounted as merely a teenager's crush of unrequited love. Because of the publishing of the letters in the newspapers, it shattered Minter's wholesome image and, more or less, portrayed her as a vamp. After Taylor's death, Minter only did four more films for Paramount and the studio never offered her another contract. Other studios wanted her to act in their movies, but being that Minter was never comfortable as an actress, she married a millionaire in 1957 and lived in the lap of luxury until her death in 1984. Police next focused on Charlotte Shelby, Minter's mother, who was a former Broadway actress and what can be described as a typical stage mother. At the age of five, her daughter, Mary Miles Minter, accompanied older sister Margaret on an audition, only because no babysitter was available and was noticed by the director and given her first part. After this, she was frequently employed, widely noted for both her talent and visual appeal. In 1912, to avoid child labor laws in Chicago while her 10-year-old daughter was appearing in a play, Shelby obtained the birth certificate of a cousin and changed Juliet's name to Mary Miles Minter. She made her first feature film in 1915 at the age of 13, after which her career steadily grew. At the time of the Taylor murder, Shelby became evasive and appeared, at least in the opinion of authorities, to be untruthful with a lot of things. Authorities seemed more interested in Shelby due to the fact that she did have a motive and they later discovered that she owned a 38 caliber revolver that required unusual rounds. This was the same type of weapon that killed Taylor that she allegedly threw into a Louisiana bayou. It has been assumed that Shelby not only worried about how Taylor may have influenced her daughter, but Shelby may have had designs on Taylor herself. Shelby traveled outside the United States in an effort to avoid any inquiries as to her involvement or press coverage with the Taylor murder. In 1936, in an argument with her other daughter, actress Margaret Shelby, the daughter accused Charlotte Shelby of the murder during a violent argument that the two had at the time. Because of Shelby's social relationships with the District Attorney's Office of Los Angeles, although strongly suspected of being the murderer, the DA's office declined to pursue the matter against Shelby. Twenty years after the murder, L.A. County District Attorney Buren Fitz stated that not enough evidence existed to bring Charlotte Shelby to trial. Fitz advocated preserving the evidence accumulated for the case until such time when there may be a break in the case. Unfortunately, the evidence has since disappeared. Charlotte Shelby died in 1957, and in 1973, Fitz committed suicide. Margaret Gibson was a film actress that met Taylor when she first came to Hollywood. 
In 1917, the young actress was indicted for prostitution and opium distribution. Gibson later changed her name to Patricia Palmer. At the time of Taylor's murder, Palmer was 27 years old and soon got work in a number of films produced by the famous players Lasky. In 1923, police arrested and jailed her on extortion charges. The charges were later dropped. In 1934, in her own words, Palmer fled the country to the Far East and married an oil executive. Her husband, Elber Lewis, died as a result of an attack on the oil refinery at Penang in Malaysia during World War II. Lewis left Palmer with a small pension that she lived on until her death in 1964. It was right before her death that she confessed to the murder of Taylor. Palmer had recently converted to Catholicism in front of a priest although no evidence existed that she ever had anything to do with the murder. Although evidence should have been sequestered, most of the documents and evidence as of this presentation are missing. As a result of the Taylor case, several others that occurred during the 1920s, including Fatty Arbuckle, studios began putting morality or moral turpitude clauses within actors' and directors' contracts. This meant that anything regarding the lack of an individual's moral compass could spell cancellation of the contract, putting the actor or director out of work. The Taylor case also shone the light on the darker side of Hollywood, a side that continued to rear its ugly head throughout history. The death of William Desmond Taylor played out in the press with several aspects that continue to generate interest in the case. Once someone claims that a sexual component may have been the reason for such haphazard handling of the case, then one understands why the case continues to haunt those who seek the truth. The death of William Desmond Taylor remains a mystery to this day. November 16, 1924, an extravagant yacht known as the Onita made her way from Los Angeles to San Diego. This vessel was owned by William Randolph Hearst, the New York newspaper mogul who used his yacht for a special birthday party. This special party was for Thomas Ince, a Hollywood innovator who began Paramount Studios and most of his changes in how studios are run are still used today. Hearst contemplated buying Paramount Studios and taking control of the entity, and Ince would be his advisor. On this particular Sunday night, all that would change. The guest list was very distinguished for this party, but it was not just any party. Thomas Ince was celebrating his birthday. Charlie Chaplin, Marion Davies, Eleanor Glynn, and later gossip columnist Luella Parsons and Eleonora Ince, Thomas's wife, among other financial and celebrity influencers who attended the party. Hearst never drank alcohol and was a teetotaler, and everyone knew not to drink in his presence. The Hollywood crowd that inhabited the boat were used to drinking and snuck their own hooch into the party. At some point in the evening, Ince complained that he was not feeling well. A physician on the yacht at that time, Dr. Daniel Goodwin, stated that Ince began to feel ill after dinner and immediately tried to get Ince to a hospital on dry land to test his malady. Once the boat docked, Dr. Goodwin accompanied Ince to a local hospital, then to Ince's home, where he passed away of heart failure on November 19, 1924. Dr. Goodwin signed an incomplete death certificate and Ince's body was cremated. Both of these actions were against California law. Ince's cause of death as being a heart attack was the official story related to the media of the day. But the next day, a newspaper headline in Los Angeles appeared to state, Movie Producer Shot on Hearst's Yacht. 
Although the coroner's report had not been issued, Ince's body had quickly been cremated. The story told through newspapers and then perpetuated by some of the guests on the Onita held a scandalous component. The famous guests on the yacht that weekend served to protect themselves and certainly Hearst could never be suspected in anything so scandalous. Charlie Chaplin allegedly telegrammed his longtime valet, Tori Achikono, to meet him at the Key in San Diego. Kono claimed that he witnessed Ince being removed from the yacht and moved into an ambulance. As Kono witnessed Ince being placed into the ambulance, he noticed that Ince's clothes were wet and there was a visible bullet hole in his head. The morning headline read, Producer Shot on Hearst's Yacht. After the initial headline was released, no trace of the paper and no one saw the headline again. Most of the guests even stated that they had other plans that weekend and averred that they had not even been near the docks. Authorities never questioned the guests, even though the district attorney's office opened an investigation into the incident. The DA for San Diego, Chester C. Kempley, stated that he was satisfied with the explanation of Ince's death by heart attack, therefore, DA Kempley refrained from conducting any serious investigation. If the accepted story was that Ince died from a heart attack, where did the cover story come from that Ince sustained a gunshot wound to the head? Marion Davies, the mistress of William Randolph Hearst, appeared to be flirting with none other than Charles Chaplin. Chaplin had a reputation for such lascivious behavior through the years he spent making movies in Hollywood. The incident that is most widely accepted is that Hearst always exhibited behavior of that of a very possessive and jealous man. He believed that Charlie Chaplin had designs on Davies and, in fact, made his move on the actress that night. In a confrontation with Chaplin, Hearst pulled a revolver and fired at Chaplin, missing him and instead fatally wounding Ince. Hearst held no animosity toward Ince, but the scandal had to be quelled before the truth became known. Is this what truly transpired? Only the people that were there that night know the truth, and all of them have since passed on. The death of Thomas Ince became one of those Hollywood legends that defined the disposability of human lives for the sake of the almighty dollar. At the Plaza Hotel in San Francisco in early September 1932, a young woman checked out of the hotel after living there for approximately six months. She stopped at the front desk and paid off her bill. Earlier that day, the young lady booked a stateroom on the Delta King Riverboat. The young woman went to the dock, got on the boat, where several witnesses saw her standing on the deck of the ship, crying. A waiter remembered her at dinner, where she rarely ate a thing. Two hours later, a security guard found a woman's coat and shoes on the very spot where the woman had been standing on the deck. On the following morning, when the Delta King docked, people noticed that the young woman did not leave the ship. Immediately, the crew and staff began looking for the woman who seemed so despondent the night before. At the same time, in Beverly Hills, California, Jean Harlow, platinum blonde star of the 1920s and 1930s, received police officers at her residence after some of the household staff discovered her husband, Paul Byrne, an MGM studio executive, dead in the bathroom of their marital home with a bullet through his skull. When investigators started probing into Byrne's backstory, they noticed that things aren't always what they seem. In fact, they discovered that Byrne had married a young woman by the name of Dorothy Millette, the young woman later to be discovered that lived at the San Francisco Plaza Hotel and then disappeared from the deck of the Delta King. In her early 20s, Jean Harlow became one of the biggest movie stars in the world. 
The movie Hell's Angel, a production from billionaire Howard Hughes, launched Harlow to stardom with her curvy figure and platinum blonde hair. When her star rose, Harlow met Byrne, who was from Germany, who convinced MGM to sign the young star. It appeared from his connections that his friendship or courtship could further the rising star's career. In fact, Byrne believed that Harlow could make a career as a serious actress rather than just pretty face on the screen. In July of 1932, after a brief courtship, Byrne and Harlow married. The couple had only been married for two months when the maid found her husband's dead body in the couple's bathroom. As in the Taylor murder, the first call went to the studio instead of the Los Angeles Police Department. Once the studio executives went to the Byrne Harlow residence, they spent two hours combing through the residence to sanitize any evidence that may be discovered. The MGM fixers spent the rest of the day developing what their spin would be to the media in order to protect Harlow. What the studio did not count on was the dogged determination of the investigators on the case. When they contacted Byrne's insurance agent, a man named George C. Clarkin, they learned that Byrne never divorced his first wife, Dorothy Millett. Byrne kept the marriage a secret and never mentioned her to anyone. Clarkin believed that Miss Byrne had died in a sanitarium. Police discovered that Byrne met Millett when both worked as actors in Toronto, Canada. Their courtship was also whirlwind, and they married a short time later in New York City where Byrne pursued a career in stage management. Just then, Millette became very ill and had to move to a sanitarium. Byrne then moved to California and it was never clear whether both of them agreed to this move. Even though Byrne began the rise at MGM as an executive, he continued to support his wife back in New York. He sent her a monthly stipend of approximately $350, 5000 in today's dollars, and Millette stayed at the Algonquin Hotel. Byrne continued to support her even up until the time that he and Harlow got married. Several letters were found in her baggage on the Delta King that Byrne signed, My love and best wishes always. On September 14, 1932, two fishermen discovered a body in the Sacramento River. The body was that of a young woman later identified as Dorothy Millett. A week prior to the discovery of her floating body, the newspapers began to refer to her as the ghost wife. Rumors spread that witnesses claimed to have seen a woman with Byrne the day before he committed suicide. Some theorized that Millette met with Byrne, murdered him for one reason or another, perhaps that he committed bigamy, then went on the run to San Francisco. As Millette's mystery life became public, the coroner in Los Angeles questioned friends and colleagues and learned that Byrne talked of suicide for a long time. Depression played a big part in Byrne's adult life. The publicity generated through Byrne's marriage to Harlow created a lot of tension in his life as well. The fixers who appeared at the marital residence before the police hinted that Byrne may have been unfitted for marriage, so to speak, and that he may have been unworthy of marriage to such a siren as Harlow. At the coroner's inquest, Byrne's personal physician knew what may have been the cause of the patient's despondency. Dr. Howard P. Jones stated that with respect to his patient, he would not disclose Byrne's condition. Innuendos surfaced that Byrne suffered from some form of erectile dysfunction, and Harlow teased him about it. After confirming Millette's identity, authorities investigated her further and learned that she knew that Byrne changed his will to make Harlow his sole beneficiary in the untimely event of his death. This made Millette a pauper almost overnight and would, in fact, provide a motive for her to murder her estranged husband. However, there has never been any substantial evidence that she did so. The timeline of events made it impossible for Millette to have murdered Byrne in the wee hours of the morning and then returned to her hotel in San Francisco, where someone witnessed her walking in the lobby by noon of that day. So who may have been responsible for the murder? Did Jean Harlow murder her husband over some failure in the bedroom? To this day, there has never actually been a satisfactory explanation as to the cause or causes of Byrne's death. Harlow went on to marry a year later, her third, that ended in divorce only after 12 months. In 1937, at the age of 26, Harlow collapsed on the set of the movie Saratoga. Doctors at the studio believed Harlow was merely suffering from the flu, but then her symptoms became more virulent. 
loss of vision, bloating, and gray skin. When a second doctor was summoned to the studio, he realized that Harlow needed to be hospitalized immediately due to kidney failure. Less than six days after the diagnosis, Harlow slipped into a coma and passed away. MGM closed for the day of her funeral. Harlow was not interred next to her husband, Paul Byrne. Dorothy Millette lies buried at East Lawn Memorial Park in Walnut Grove with her headstone reading, Dorothy Millette Byrne. On the morning of June 16, 1959, the once talented Hollywood star, adored by fans all over the world, lay naked in his bedroom, dead from a single gunshot wound to the side of the head. The people that attended a get-together the night before in the downstairs living room stated they were too drunk to remember hearing anything, much less the gunshot that ended the idol's life. His then-girlfriend sat downstairs with two friends as her paramour allegedly decided to end his life. When authorities arrived to perform a cursory investigation of the crime, they found the victim lying naked in a pool of blood, a weapon between his feet, a shell casing underneath the body, a bullet in his brain, and a thick spray of his gore stretching up to the wall to the slanted ceiling. Investigators immediately deduced that though the star's death was tragic, it appeared that he committed suicide. Some considered that conclusion to be somewhat premature. Several factors contributed to the doubts exhibited as to the particulars of the death of Superman, George Reeves. George Reeves was born George Kiefer Brewer on January 5, 1914 in Woolstock, Iowa a small farming community approximately 83 miles north of Des Moines. As an only child, George's father, Don Brewer, divorced his mother not too long after his birth. Soon thereafter, George's mother, Helen Brewer, moved her and her infant son to Pasadena, California. Being there only a short time, Helen met one Frank Basolo, and subsequently, the two were married. Frank then adopted young George, and the young boy became known as George Basolo. After he graduated from high school, young George enrolled at Pasadena Junior College where he pursued music and acting. George also joined the choir playing the guitar and performing in different college productions. At the age of 21, in 1935, George joined a very popular and prestigious theater, the Pasadena Community Playhouse, where he appeared in various productions over the next four years. In 1939, casting agents for the famous Hollywood producer, David O. Selznick, were looking for young talent to star in his epic production of Gone with the Wind. The agents approached Reeves to read for a small part and he was cast under a different name, Brent Tarleton. Because Reeves did so well in such a small part, Warner Brothers awarded the young, handsome actor with a contract. After this break, Brent Tarleton became George Reeves. After signing the contract, Reeves appeared in some minor roles until 1943 when Warner Brothers cast him as a wounded World War II soldier who fell in love with his co-star Claudette Colbert in the movie So Proudly We Hail. With the U.S. now embroiled in World War II since 1941, Reeves decided to join the army and play his patriotic part. As an actor, Reeves was assigned to a special theatrical unit of the U.S. Army Air Corps, where his superiors assigned him to training films for the armed services including the dangers of venereal disease. When he was stationed in New York, Reeves was asked to play a bit role in a play entitled 
Winged Victory. When the show concluded, Reeves traveled with the touring company of the play. When the war ended and Reeves received his discharge, beginning in 1946, he starred in what some have called embarrassments for an actor. Later known as B-movies, Reeves took forgettable roles in movies entitled Jungle Goddess and Thunder in the Pines. But the role that he would become known for, and later some say typecasted, occurred in 1951. At that time, the country experienced a recession and Reeves was reduced to just walk-on parts. Even the big-name stars with the studios received pink slips. Then, Reeves met the wife of a studio executive that would not only help his career, but spelled doom for the actor. Her name, Tony Mannix, and her husband, Eddie Mannix, MGM Vice President. In that year, and with the influence of Tony Mannix, Reeves reluctantly accepted the leading role in the television series, The Adventures of Superman. Tony Mannix was eight years Reeves senior and started in show business as a Ziegfeld Follies girl. Prior to marrying Eddie Mannix, she fit the role of his mistress for a year. When Tony married her husband, she met Reeves when the marriage seemed to be on the rocks. Eddie Mannix did not seem very worried about whether his wife had an affair with Reeves or not. Certainly, the casting couch did provide a great deal of opportunity for Eddie Mannix as a powerful Hollywood mogul. Strangely, Eddie Mannix would double date with his mistress along with Reeves and Tony Mannix. Word about town was that Reeves was a kept man, receiving gifts from his lover such as a car, a pocket watch, clothes, furniture, and even a house. But the two engaged in the relationship with the understanding that when Eddie Mannix died, Reeves and Tony would be married. When it came to the adventures of Superman, at first, audiences, especially the young children that flocked to their newfangled television sets in the early evening to watch their superhero, Reeves' show brought high ratings and critical acclaim. Reeves played both Clark Kent and Superman and became a household name in the United States and around the world. One would think that if your star rises rather quickly that one would be appreciative for the breaks. But by all accounts, Reeves became disillusioned as to the course his career was taking. But given a chance to change his image from a TV star into a bona fide movie star failed as Reeves was cast in the Academy Award winning film From Here to Eternity. What he thought would propel him into movie superstardom, Reeves did not appear for very long in the film and this would turn out to be his last movie role. When patrons went to the theater, they would just yell out, Hey, it's Superman! When Reeves accepted the role of Superman in 1951, the series would not appear for another two years until 1953. The series became so popular that Reeves appeared at department stores and other publicity events in costume. Moreover, when on hiatus, the actors could not devote enough time to other projects where they could expand their acting influence. The Superman series paid Reeves $2,500 per week, an astronomical wage for those days, but the filming extended to 52 weeks a year. Reeves seemed to be going into that direction and feared playing the Man of Steel would be a detriment to his career. He was correct. Over the course of the series, Reeves suffered from what some horror stars like Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi struggled with for their entire careers, typecasting where they could not develop any other talents that they may have. After every season when the show filming ended, Reeves burned his Superman costume. When the show ended in 1959, after five seasons as Superman, the show was canceled. Reeves then left his fiancée, Tony Mannix, and began a serious relationship with Lenore Lemon, a local brunt of gossip columns across the country. This incident struck Tony Mannix hard as she considered Reeves to be her shining prize. Tony Mannix seemed to retreat into her home and telephone Reeves at least 20 times a day. Because of this behavior, friends worried about Mannix's health and gave birth to one theory as to Reeves' death. Eddie Mannix had been in ill health for quite some time and before becoming a studio executive during the golden age of Hollywood, he grew up with gangsters, the likes of Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, along with Irish and Jewish gangsters as well, when Eddie lived in New Jersey. 
Eddie Mannix also had connections with mobsters in Los Angeles as well as the chief of police. As far as his wife was concerned, although Eddie Mannix sustained a large amount of affairs, when it came to his wife, he was very protective. Additionally, Mannix's first wife died mysteriously in a car accident in 1937, with some claiming that she was uncooperative when it came to Mannix's unofficial title of being the fixer for MGM. Unofficially, Mannix quelled rumors about reckless affairs, drunk driving arrests, wife beatings, drug arrests, and union disagreements. It became readily apparent to anyone who knew the executive that when a problem arose such as the nature of those previously mentioned, Mannix certainly knew the right muscle to contact. On the night of June 15, 1959, Reeves and Lemon sat at the residence located at 1579 Benedict Canyon Drive. The two lovers were joined by writer Robert Condon, who had been staying with the couple. At approximately 1 a.m., Reeves was in bed when more guests arrived at the house. Drinking permeated most of the evening, and the group that gathered in the living room became very loud, forcing Reeves to trek downstairs to yell at the guests to keep the noise down. Reeves then apologized and went back upstairs to his bedroom. Allegedly, Lemon commented that, he's going upstairs to shoot himself. Lemon explained her comment to the other guests when she also said, see, he's opening the drawer to get to the gun. Suddenly, all of the guests heard what sounded like a gunshot. Lemon confirmed the morbid activity when she finally told her guests, I told you, he shot himself. By this time, the guests, including Lemon and Condon, were very drunk. According to the police reports, Reeves allegedly shot himself at approximately 1.59 a.m. The guests failed to call the police for over 45 minutes following the sound of the gunshot. After the police were called and they arrived a short time later and noticed that the witnesses' reflections were not that clear. When investigators walked into Reeves' bedroom, they noted him laying naked in a pool of blood, a luger between his legs, and a shell casing underneath his corpse. Although the coroner's assessment concluded suicide, questions remained with the actor's friends and colleagues as to whether he actually committed suicide or was there something more sinister afoot. Several things occurred during the investigation that caused doubt as to the official story of Reeves' death. Firstly, when investigators further viewed the crime scene, they noticed four bullet holes in the floor of his bedroom. Secondly, the coroner noted that Reeves sustained bruising all over his body. And finally, shell casings were located all over the bedroom in some very strange places. When looking at Reeves' death, investigators, friends, and colleagues alike believed his death was no accident. Theories abounded as to who may have been responsible. It is almost certainly feasible that his ex-lover, Tony Mannix, had more than motive to execute Reeves. After all, her husband did have connections to the underworld that held no compunction to killing someone for money. On the night before the incident, Reeves and Lemon went out to dinner and drank heavily while leaving Condon at the house around 11 p.m. Reeves went to bed alone around midnight and did not return to the living room until he complained about the noise made by the neighbors and Lemon at approximately 1 a.m. in the morning on the 16th. The list of neighbors included Carol Von Ronkel, Condon's married girlfriend, and William Bliss, member of the community, but unknown to the rest of the people there. After Reeves complained, he then apologized to the rest of the room and returned to his bedroom upstairs. When police confronted Lemon as to what she stated to the others prior to hearing the shot, she stated she was just drunk. William Bliss was the first one to run upstairs and discover Reeves' body. After Reeves' death, his mother firmly believed that her son was murdered. She based this on the fact that after the police sealed the house as a crime scene, Lemon went back to the scene, broke the tape, and left for New York with over $4,000 in traveler's checks. She never returned to Los Angeles. Although the mystery remains as to whether George Reeves' death was suicide or murder still raises speculation. As she lay on her deathbed, Tony Mannix allegedly confessed to her priest that she had Reeves murdered. 
Her confession never stipulated how Reeves could have been murdered with a house full of witnesses. Lenore Lemon had frequently been suspected of murdering Reeves after she gave her statement to the police with several holes for researchers to investigate. She claimed that the neighbors got to the house that night and she and Reeves were involved in one of their massive fights. Lemon claimed she fired a shot from the weapon used in Reeves' death into one of the living room walls. Thirty years later, Lemon admitted to an interviewer that William Bliss made up her statements to make the story more interesting, but she never claimed ownership of the morbid predictions prior to Reeves' death. As far as Lemon protruding as a suspect throughout this mystery, if Reeves' death was ever considered a homicide, the evidence is scant. Can we take at face value that perhaps the normal human emotions that face aging actors overcame Reeves to the point where he killed himself? Utilizing common sense and some investigative techniques, although there are several factors here that demand more investigation, unless there is a statement or confession that one can deem authentic, the death of Superman will remain a mystery. been described as a, quote, fiend, demon, and lunatic, unquote, murdered five prostitutes and is suspected in the murder of as many as eleven. Quote, Jack the Ripper, unquote, sealed his bloody legacy in history with a reign of terror that even today, historians and researchers still ponder the identity of this murderer. More books are written on the subject and have been written on the subject than any other unsolved case. But 22 years before, an even more horrific killer stalked the streets of another major European city. But unlike the Whitechapel murderer, this quote, ripper, unquote, would be stalked by one dogged detective who made sure that the murdered people would not go down in history as quote, a cold case. Unquote. On the morning of January 9th, 1866, Paris is buzzing with the news of another murder. It seemed that over the last four years, prostitutes in the City of Lights suffered a most horrific fate at the hands of an unknown butcher. On the night of January 8th, a 73-year-old man, Marcel Malwazo, returned to his home. Malwazo stopped at the second floor apartment of Marie Baudou, a sex worker in Paris who occupied a small apartment just a few floors above a Paris police station. Malwazo befriended the young woman and checked on her periodically, especially with a mad killer on the loose. When Malwazo approached Baudou's door, he noticed it ajar. When Malwazo opened the door and peered in, he noticed by a flickering candlelight, a man, quote, standing before the mirror, adjusting his tie, unquote. Not much of an unusual sight within the apartment of a known prostitute. Malwazo, seeing that perhaps the transaction had not been completed between the prostitute and her client, stepped back into the hallway to await the man's departure. As Malwazo waited in the hallway, he noticed that the man may be taking longer than usual to leave Baudu's apartment. After all, the elderly man noticed the gentleman fixing his tie. It should not have taken as long for him to leave the apartment. Just when Malwazo opened the apartment door again, the man he saw fixing his tie just a few minutes before rushed past Malwazo and hastily bid the old man, quote, bonjour, unquote. Malwazo walked past the man into Baudu's apartment. He found the prostitute on the floor, dead. Her throat had been deeply cut, her body laying in a pool of blood. 
Her throat was cut so deeply that she was almost decapitated. When Mao Wazo alerted the police, the man had already escaped. Over the previous five years, Paris police felt as though this killer would never see the inside of the Cour d'Aziz. Eight women, mostly prostitutes, and two children had been murdered over that period of time, and even though they possessed a physical description of the assailant, which they received 18 months before by a young woman named Fouché, they still held no idea as to the identity of the alleged perpetrator. The killer left Baudou as he left the victims before, strangled, then their throats cut from ear to ear, almost to the point of decapitation. The killer then washed himself, trying to destroy any of the gore that obviously saturated his clothing and person, then began tearing through the dead woman's belongings to find anything of value. One thing was for sure, in addition to possessing a description of the murderer, Police knew the man had a tattoo that stated, quote, born under an unlucky star, unquote, with the star beneath the writing. Three days subsequent to the attack and murder of Marie Baudou, an artist living within the prostitution district of Paris, Madame Midi, heard a strange knock at her door. When she opened the door, she allegedly recognized the man. His name was Louis-Joseph Philippe who worked as a handyman around Madame Meadie's apartment. Philippe informed the artist that he may have left some tools at her residence the last time he did work there. Madame Meadie immediately stated to Philippe that she had not left the apartment in a few days, and if he had left any tools there, she would have found them. When the artist informed Philippe that she found no tools, he drew a pillowcase from beneath his coat and asked her if the pillowcase belonged to her. Madame Midi became agitated at Philippe's questions and turned her back on him. When she turned, Philippe took the pillowcase and violently put it over her head, forcing the slackened cloth over her face into her mouth. With the other hand, Philippe began to choke her. Madame Midi struggled and screamed, breaking free of Philippe's grip. At the same time, a neighbor of Madame Midi happened to be passing her door and heard the commotion. Philippe rushed from the apartment, past the neighbor, and stated that Madame Meadie had taken sick and he was off to retrieve a doctor. When Philippe reached the street, the alarm had been sounded and neighbors managed to subdue him in the street before the apartment building. After a brief search of his person, police found a long knife and a search of his apartment yielded, quote, several blood-stained items belonging to some of the victims, including Marie Baudou. Unquote. After police realized that they possibly had their murderer, they investigated the background of the suspect. Louis Joseph Philippe was born in 1831 in Villemanfroy, eastern France, near the Swiss border. Philippe served in the French army but received some disciplinary action for being drunk and miscellaneous on military behavior. After being discharged from the army, Philippe found himself in Paris. Employers noted that Philippe was a hard worker, but often reported for work drunk. Philippe once said to a waitress in a wine bar, I am very fond of women, and I accommodate them in my own way. I first strangle them and then cut their throats. Wait a bit and you will hear me talked about. Authorities believed that Philippe first began killing in 1861 when he first arrived in Paris. When confronted by authorities regarding the previous 10 murders, Philippe denied any knowledge of the crimes. Criminologists at the time believed that Philippe's love of drink caused his violent and grotesque behavior. In fact, they surmised from the English newspaper The Daily Telegraph, quote, nothing but seeing women in the agonies of death would subdue him." Unquote. Philippe actually used the murders to make a living in between jobs by robbing the women he murdered to sustain his drinking habits. A Monsieur Claude, a top-notch detective, had been pursuing Philippe since he connected the first two murders to the series Philippe had started in 1861. Claude would not let this maniac slip through his clutches. All in all, French authorities suspected Philippe in 10 murders that occurred over the last six years. However, they only found evidence linking him to four murders. Julia Robert, 
a 26-year-old prostitute, Flora Maget, 32 years old, and her four-year-old son, and Marie Victorine Baudou. After standing trial, the court convicted Philippe in record time and sentenced him to death. On January 28, 1866, the court's sentence was carried out when Philippe died at the hand of the executioner by guillotine. The condemned man had no last words. Certainly, Philippe may have set the stage for, quote, Jack the Ripper, unquote, some 22 years later, but unlike the Whitechapel murderer, Philippe displayed disorganization and lacked any thought usually associated with a modern serial killer. In any case, positively, four people died at his hand, and history has attributed another six to his bloody legacy. Hey, if you liked our presentation, please hit the like button, subscribe, hit the bell, and also tell your friends about us as well. Check out our other videos on the channel. I'm sure you won't be disappointed. Also, if you want to support this channel so we can continue to bring you further programming, check us out at subscribestar.com, rumble.com, and we have a PayPal account, and I'll leave the links to that in the comments section below, along with the links to our Facebook and Twitter accounts. Until next time.